So I'm talking today a bit about um, um, uh, a paper that we put together um, a few months ago to think about how we can um, look at evaluating AI initiatives in healthcare. So I'm not really um, from an AI background, but I have been interested for a long time in how we evaluate digital health uh, projects. And as AI is increasingly getting integrated into digital health um, projects, I thought I'd just give a bit of an overview of um, what we thought when we, we had a, a working group looking at um, open science approaches to AI. So what we thought about when in that working group and how we could think about how we should be um, adopting AI and healthcare in a way that's safe and user friendly and is gonna work uh, in the healthcare context. Um, so first of all, just to, I know lots of people here are probably way more expert in AI than me, but I thought I'd just give a very high level overview of what I think are the main kind of concepts um, in AI that you have to kind of uh, just have some kind of understanding on in order to um, uh, progress. So there's really um, two main kind of um, areas in AI. One is um, what's called symbolic AI or uh, good old fashioned AI, GoFi. And this is what has been around for many decades now. And this is um, uh, what they've called an expert system, which is basically quite a straightforward computer program or an algorithm where you have if then and sequences, so if this condition, then do that. And it's how a lot of um, computer programs work. But the idea is that it becomes AI when the complexity of that gets to the point where it starts to look something like uh, intelligence or human level intelligence. So it's not really a very concrete definition, uh, but this type of expert system or symbolic AI has been in use for quite a while and is actually um, used in healthcare quite a bit. So in healthcare, we have a lot of um, uh, decision support algorithms or treatment algorithms that you say if a patient's got this symptom and that symptom then you should do this test and if the result of this test is this then do that and that kind of sequence has been embedded in computer programs uh, like symptom checkers so if you go to the NHS 111 online it will take you through um, a sequence uh, like that which um, some people might um, call uh, AI and then it's also used in things like uh, drug interaction um, alerts. So if you're entering a prescription into a computer system in a hospital, it might pick up that the drug you're prescribing interacts with the drug someone else has prescribed previously and might cause the drug not to work or to have a dangerous side effect. And there's all sorts of other tools like that, which are, which are kind of like this, which are uh, starting to get developed um, in healthcare. And lots of apps that do this kind of thing. And quite often they'll refer to themselves as uh, AI. Um, then there's the other type, which is what we um, more commonly talk about as AI uh, nowadays, uh, which is uh, machine learning. And this is where you create uh, computer programs that resemble uh, the way the biological neural networks work in our brains. And it's, uh, they call them artificial neural networks. And they um, allow the computer to learn an algorithm as opposed to being programmed by an expert. So uh, the computer quite often will have a set of inputs uh, which can then get matched to whether or not um, the decision the computer makes is correct. So it might be um, uh, a set of radiology films, so x-rays, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about a project around that in a minute, uh, that have been interpreted. And you might have thousands of these x-rays that have been interpreted in the computer system uh, uses, uh, uh, analyzes the image and then can extract information and check whether what it thinks is correct is what the human uh, said it was correct and then build an algorithm um, on the way that it uh, manages to make that correct decision. So this uh, field was very, is very computer intensive and it's only really in um, very recent years that um, uh, computer power has been and data sets have been large enough to do it. So obviously you can imagine if a computer is only getting a minimal amount of input and a, this is right or wrong output, it has to try lots and lots and lots of options in order to uh, build an algorithm that's going to be accurate. And so this is just an example of a kind of time lapse of a computer building an algorithm, which is from um, Google's uh, DeepMind DeepQ learning program. So what they did is they gave it um, uh, a computer screen with a game and all that the computer could see is the pixels on the screen. 
and all it could do was move uh, a controller left and right. And then for the, out, for the output, it was the score. So it knew if its score was increasing, it knew what all the pixels, the colors of all the pixels were, and it knew, uh, and it, all it could do is move um, a controller left or right. And it didn't know that the controller was gonna move anything on the screen, didn't know what the screen was gonna do or anything like that. And so um, I'll just skip a bit of the introduction. So you've probably played this game. I played this game when I was a kid. And um, so you can see at the start, uh, it's just randomly moving the thing around, doesn't know what, uh, what it's doing. It's just missing the ball. And then, it, then it starts to hit, the ball hits the pad and it then starts to build some kind of algorithm around, okay, the score goes up if it hits the pad. And this is after 120 minutes um, of training. And it's now starting to be able to catch the ball and um, send it, um, send it back up. And I remember as a kid, it took us kind of weeks and weeks to learn, <laughs> learn how to do this. Um, but then eventually the clever thing they say is it starts to work out then strategies for maximizing its score with the minimum amount of input. So then it works out that, and this is, we worked this out when we were kids as well. I remember reading the, the paper about this and they said it was a novel strategy, which it wasn't at all because when I was a kid, we worked uh, this out. But the idea was to tunnel and it's one of the objectives of the game, really. You tunnel, make a tunnel up through the, the side of it by directing the ball up, and then it bounces along the top and you get lots of points for doing that. So that's, a, that's basically a machine having very minimal input, getting some feedback on whether it's correct or not. And that's quite a kind of clear example of um, uh, machine learning and how that works. And if you go on Google, there's loads of these things. Now they're playing like full-blown computer games, like massively open online games and things. Um, and uh, you know, it's advanced a lot since this was done. So can I advance? Okay, so what you'll see um, nowadays is if you've got an app or um, um, a medical company that's a medical AI company, quite often they're actually combining good old fashioned AI and machine learning. So this is a company that uh, is well, is quite um, talked about quite a lot in AI, this is Babylon Health. And they have an app called NHS Online, if you're registered in GP practices in London. And it's a, mainly a chat box. So the chat bot, uh, the start of it is a chat bot. So the chat bot uses, a, uses machine learning approaches, um, uh, algorithms developed through machine learning for natural language processing. So you can type in a question and um, there's lots of libraries out there which will interpret your, your um, question as data for a computer. So it'll understand the meaning of what you're trying to type in. So that's a machine learning thing. And then it will then, once it's worked out what you're trying to say, then it will use a good old fashioned AI expert system, which is all the NHS algorithms that have been developed over lots of times, but it's now stored in a database uh, to say, okay, if we've understood that your symptom is a headache, uh, let's look that up on the, on the uh, expert system and it says, okay, if it's a headache, you've got to ask them, you know, how long have they had the headache for? So then it'll ask them and then it'll reinterpret the text again uh, using machine learning approaches. And I think they also use other machine learning approaches to optimize that whole process and to see how, how good the quality is and try and update the expert system uh, as well. Um, and it's uh, just, we're kind of probably having this talk now because it's all, everyone's talking about AI. It's all kind of taking off at the moment. And this is just um, a way of graphically demonstrating this. This is uh, equity funding for, in the US, I think, for um, funding in kind of AI in healthcare startups. And you can see that um, over the last couple of years, it's all starting to go um, uh, upwards. So this is uh, the bit of work that we did, which was, um, uh, we're part of, uh, there's a group called the International Medical Informatics Association, and we have a working group, which is around, um, around open source. And um, we've done some work last year on uh, open data, and this year uh, we wanted to write about uh, open science as an approach to artificial intelligence in healthcare. So I'll just uh, say what that's about. So open science is probably something that's been on the radar. It's um, things like open access publishing, uh, opening up data sets, making sure that experiments are reproducible, um, uh, having uh, standard policies, protocols that are uh, open, all this kind of thing, which is all kind of becoming um, a standard approach to doing science now. So we wanted to see whether 
because AI is a new field, is it apply these do these um, ideas apply in the field of AI? And it's quite apparent that AI as it is now only exists because of some of the open approaches that they've um, had over the last kind of 10 years or so. So one of the first uh, massive open online courses, which is part of the open science idea of ed open educational resources was on AI. So this is Andrew Ng, who's one of the co-founders of uh, Coursera, and he had the most popular uh, online course, which is on machine learning. So they've had uh, two and a half million students uh, enrolled on the course. And you imagine that, that in terms of human resources of people who are now uh, kind of data scientists and using machine learning, it must have had quite a big impact on the adoption of um, AI as a field. Uh, also, there's uh, open access publishing. So uh, the idea of publishing in uh, closed access journals in the kind of computer science era of AI would seem quite strange, I think, to computer scientists. So uh, all of the big AI con conferences, they publish their proceedings and papers, uh, open access. And archive.org, which is a huge kind of resource, has a large uh, machine learning um, section. Uh, however, uh, when we look at open AI in healthcare, uh, that's not necessarily the case. So there's still quite a lot of medical research that's published in closed access journals, although there is, is a slow trend uh, to increasing um, open access, especially for publicly funded or philanthropically funded uh, research. Uh, then we looked at open source software and open source tools. And again, it's very evident that uh, the world of machine learning and AI is based on open source uh, software. So uh, even uh, the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit has got uh, MIT open source license, but things like TensorFlow are very well used. And we've got a project now which is using uh, TensorFlow uh, for um, doing some uh, AI for training. And uh, it's very accessible. There's lots of documentation, lots of videos on how to do things. And a lot of the AI projects are based on these uh, open source uh, tools. And these, these have largely been developed by these big web companies. So people like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, um, all of their platform is based on AI and they've open sourced the technology that they've used um, uh, to build it. Then the next area is open data. So <clears throat> um, probably the biggest area of open data in healthcare, uh, which is used in machine learning and AI is in genomics. Um, and there's huge open uh, genomics uh, data sets now. Um, my interest is more in the uh, kind of clinical side of things. And this is where some of the new interesting AI uh, things are happening. Uh, and there's a big open data set called uh, Chexpert. And I thought I'd just uh, describe that a bit so that it kind of gives you an example of how uh, you could go about doing an AI project. So uh, basically they took uh, chest x-rays, I think they had uh, 220,000 chest x-rays from Stanford, uh, from the hospital in Stanford, um, and then they went through, reviewed the x-rays uh, for 14 different um, findings that they wanted to see. So it's kind of a a limited number of things that you would you'd do more than that normally on a chest x-ray, but it's just to find the kind of big uh, kind of um, common things that you'd see on a chest x-ray. So they had this data, so they've got a data set now of hundreds of thousands of images, all which have got all of the key findings kind of classified. So then you can say, okay, just put all of those images uh, through these uh, machine learning engines and then try and train them to get the correct uh, classifications as according to the uh, doctors. And anyone can download that uh, database and upload it. And then they've got a leaderboard of um, uh, different algorithms that people have developed using machine learning approaches and how accurate they are at diagnosing um, the conditions. And the top ones are uh, incredibly accurate. So then finally, um, uh, come to open research. So that's all pretty good, I think. And, you know, uh, a good example for other types of research on how open um, science uh, approaches. But uh, quite often it just, it reaches that, that point and stops in terms of the um, openness. So one of the big challenges, and people have probably heard about this, is the idea of um, uh, black box algorithms. So you can imagine the expert systems that are designed by doctors and healthcare professionals where they've carefully gone through these decision-making algorithms to come up with them. 
that's all a very transparent, open process. You know what the algorithms are, they can be edited and changed. But if you just chuck all the images in um, to, a, to a neural net, um, the algorithm that comes out will look, you know, might look fairly sensible, but you don't know how it's uh, necessarily come up with it because it's millions and millions of iterations. It's correcting itself all the time and it's, it, you can't really unpick how it's come up with the algorithm that it's got. So they call it this black box. And uh, the output of that is measured normally on this type of curve, uh, which is called a rock curve. And uh, you measure the area under the curve to see how uh, accurate the algorithm is, which is the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And what you're trying to do is get the area under the curve to be one. So if you see on the, on the leaderboard, they've got area under the curve of uh, 0.907, which is very accurate and probably more accurate than uh, radiologists would be um, diagnosing x-rays. But our argument would be that that isn't sufficient in itself. And there's lots of papers now say, or you can see news reports that say things like, uh, you know, we've, we've developed this new algorithm for diagnosing, you know, uh, cardiomegaly and it's better than, you know, 99% of doctors, you know, they miss more than we miss. Um, but that's not the end of the story. That doesn't mean you should just then put that algorithm into a hospital and run with it. And we need uh, to think about, you know, what is it going to be required for us to start using these uh, in day-to-day -day life? So that some things are already being used, like the, that Babylon Health thing is already being used. Um, but uh, various groups have been coming together and FDA have been doing this to try and think about what's going to be the level of evidence we need uh, to say that uh, just because your algorithm has got an area under the curve of 0.9, then it should be implemented in a healthcare context. So they, what they, the way the approach that people are taking generally is what's the purpose of the algorithm and how critical is it in the process uh, of uh, dealing with patients or helping patients? Um, uh, um, how dependent are you on the algorithm? How dangerous is it essentially? So for things that are just using uh, AI for like appointment booking or something very giving a bit of information, then obviously you don't need to run a big RCT. But if it's going to be critical in the diagnosis process, if you're going to remove the radiologists and just use the algorithm, then we need to know in the real world, in day-to-day -day, uh, operation in a hospital, you're going to have to have quite high quality evidence that you're not harming uh, patients. And there's all sorts of uh, different things in between. So this is just to try and put it in perspective of how we do other um, trials. So most people now consider digital health interventions to be uh, complex interventions and there's frameworks like this. This is from the uh, MRC uh, complex intervention framework on how we should go about evaluating and looking at um, uh, complex interventions. So if you say like an AI and uh, powered digital health app or tool is a complex intervention, there's lots of things you need to think about in terms of um, uh, prototyping, testing, uh, conducting uh, rigorous trials, uh, studying how you did the trials and um, having some kind of monitoring and long-term follow-up of how it's being used, which is expensive and difficult. And if you look on things like the App Store, the apps are proliferating all the time and that advance in AI is not stopping. So there's going to be a huge number of tools that if we took a more traditional approach to evaluation, it's going to be quite expensive and delay the, uh, the implementation of these tools that we can see from the lab are incredibly effective. So that chest x-ray dye is very accurate when it's looking for specific things, but we do need to make sure it's gonna work in real life. So I just kind of um, thought I'd put together a few kind of key fields that need to be brought to bear in order to study these. Um, so one is to think of digital health as uh, behavior change. So, you're, so what you're doing, yeah. So what you're doing is, um, uh, you're not trying to improve the accuracy of radiology diagnosis. You're, you're trying to change the behavior of people who are working in the healthcare system. So trying to group your app using behavior change theory uh, is going to guide you in how you are going to do your evaluation. And then to think of the field of human factors engineering has long studied how people use technology and how to, uh, people should interact in technology in a safe way. So things like... Um, the, the display panels and nuclear power stations, things like that. There's been this field for, ten, uh, for, for decades and we need to apply this knowledge and um, understanding when we're implementing um, digital health. 
And then finally, um, this idea of learning health systems, which is as we're digitizing the healthcare system anyway, let's use the data that's being collected, the routine data, to see what impact these new interventions are having. And if you set it up correctly and you use high, you collect high quality data on what's actually going on in healthcare facilities and what the real outcomes are, then you can much more cost effectively potentially run trials of new interventions and new uh, technologies. So thank you very much.